Hey guys, welcome back. So now we gotta talk about Avengers, X-Men, and Eternals Judgment Day, which is really just the Eternals versus the X-Men with the Avengers caught in the middle. But before we get into it, first I gotta take the time to talk about why the Eternals are even doing this. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so before we dive right in, first we gotta talk about what brought us to this point. And to do that, I gotta talk about how the Avengers, the Eternals, and the X-Men are involved here. And really when it comes down to it, it's about how the Avengers and the Eternals are involved in the way that this fell into the lap of the X-Men who are just minding their own business. But either way, starting with the Avengers, in the beginning of Avengers Volume 8 by Jason Aaron, we got the introduction to the Avengers 1 million BC, when at the time we had witnessed the fall of a weakened celestial to where then we fast forward to the modern day where the Avengers find hundreds of anomalies forming around Earth and with Captain Marvel being the first to respond, she then finds that these anomalies are actually portals that are just dropping out dead celestials, hundreds of them in fact, that were just falling from the sky all around the world which had then led to heroes from all over shuffling around to minimize casualties in populated areas. But also around this time you had T'Challa who had reached out to Doctor Strange to help him investigate ancient remains within a dig site which had then led them to the center of the earth where they then find millions of these green eggs that soon after start hatching with these huge bugs coming out that begin to attack them and later we come to find out that these quote unquote bugs from hell as Ghost Rider Robbie Reyes would call them are officially known as the Horde, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit along with Mephisto's connection to the Horde. But this then all escalated quickly when three dark celestials showed up which marked the arrival of the final host, who made their way here to purge the planet. And to tie this into some of our recent talks on Avengers, it was also around this time when Isan the Searcher fell next to Jennifer Walters and with him barely alive, he telepathically called for her help. He gave her a hulking gamma upgrade so she could help the Celestials fight the Horde and also be part of the cure. And I talk more about that in the She-Hulk video where I go through all of her transformations from Civil War 2 all the way up till now. And I got that link below for anyone who needs to get caught up. But not long after this, we then get the reveal that it was Loki who had led the final host to Earth. And this is where it starts to pull things together before so much more gets added on. Cause at this time Loki had explained to Captain America, letting him know that he wanted to show him the infection, while also letting Cap know that the patient is the Earth and it's time that she either healed or died. And it's here where Loki shows Cap, the celestial that had fallen 4 billion years ago, who's known as the Progenitor. Which then leads into the story of Loki telling Cap about how what the heroes thought they knew as far as the celestials coming to Earth and experimenting on humans was just a lie. But instead it was the Progenitor who had been infected by the Horde, who had fell to Earth and died a long slow death. Death. And from its arrival from 4 billion years ago up until today, the energy that had bled from the celestial, it saturated the earth and over the years this is what caused the evolution of mutants and the dawn of heroes on this planet. And to go a step further, we later find out in Avengers issue 38 that this is something that Mephisto had witnessed as well, 4 billion years ago in the form of a fly, when he had laid the first of a billion maggots, which from there takes us into the story of how Mephisto believed that this world was to be his, but regardless of how much he tried over billions of years, the heroes or the Avengers, they would find a way somehow to make it out on top. But then after this, in the present day, we find that Iron Man and Doctor Strange have made their way to Olympia, the home of the Eternals, to get some answers but only to find the place destroyed with a number of Eternals who have killed themselves and each other as a result of going mad after seeing the truth. And it's here where Tony finds Icarus who's barely alive. And for Icarus, with his dying breath, he tells Tony that the truth tore us apart. The Eternals were great fools, we weren't here to protect you but instead they were here to cultivate because to them, to the space gods, you are a useful pathogen. Don't let the final host unleash the horde. Only the Unimind can stop them. Only you can be the cure. And it's here where Icarus gives Tony the secrets to the Unimind just before he dies. And from there, Tony then takes this information to the rest of the Avengers and together they figure out how to stop the horde because collectively they realize that with the Horde being a disease to the Celestials and the Progenitor dying of that disease 4 billion years ago, that rather than the Celestials just destroying Earth, when the first host arrived, they allowed that disease to stay with the Progenitor because they knew that years later, this would give mankind mutants and people with superpowers who grow powerful enough years later to be able to defeat the Horde, which more or less made mankind a live virus vaccine, which is why the Celestials had the Eternals cultivate mankind all the way through to the 
the present day when they're ready to be the cure, which here and now is the Avengers. And with them figuring this out, Tony told the other heroes how the Unimind solution was the key, and it was from there where all the heroes combined their minds and their energies merged with the dead Celestial, which is what they then used to defeat the Horde. And shortly after this, the Celestials had then taken Loki, but with doing so, they had also given the Avengers a gift, which from here was the Celestials raising the Progenitor up from the depths at the North Pole, which from then to this current time has made the Progenitor the Avengers' new headquarters, otherwise known as Avengers Mountain. So where from there, there's plenty of other things going on. But for the sake of this video, this is where we cross over to the Eternals. Because at the beginning of Kieran Gillen's Eternals, we're given the rebirth of Icarus, with him being one of the last Eternals we saw die, which is what makes him here the last one to be brought back. But with the seeing him return here within the exclusion that's located below the South Pole, this then leads to Icarus finally finding out that between the time of his death and rebirth, Zerus has become the new Prime Eternal. And soon after this, we then head to New York, where Icarus and Sprite are spotted by Tony Stark. Who for Tony, with him seeing the Eternals at this point, he's kind of side-eyeing him like, you guys okay? Because the last time he had seen him over in Olympia, they were kind of killing themselves and each other. So that's why Tony's hitting Icarus with the, hey, you, you good? Because last time he seen him, he wasn't good. Matter of fact, nobody was good. It was just a pile of bodies. But of course, Icarus tells Tony that the Eternals are much better now, which is really a dry response more than anything else because the Eternals still have a lot to figure out. And that list of things to figure out then gets worse when Icarus and the others back over in Olympia find out that Zerus, the Prime Eternal, has been murdered by someone who's crushed Zerus' head with their bare hand which had then led us to discovering that not only was this done by Thanos, but also that he was getting inside help from Festos, who had retrieved the body of Thanos before it went into the black hole back in Guardians of the Galaxy, to where then he made a deal with Thanos, telling him that he's the weapon that he needs. Because with Festos discovering that Thanos is a true Eternal, which goes back to our talks on Thanos Rises, back when I talked about how the Eternals had made Thanos, but for Festos, with him discovering that Thanos is a true Eternal, Festos then tells him that if he helps him, then he will make sure that Thanos is fully integrated into the machine, which at this point Thanos isn't because Thanos is an Eternal that was born Deviant. And trust me, that part makes a lot more sense after reading Thanos Rises. But in addition to them making this deal, Festos had planted a contingency within Thanos just in case Thanos betrayed him. And of course, Thanos was aware of this contingency, but he accepted the deal anyway because he saw it as a challenge for him to later turn the tables in his favor somewhere along the line. But the revelation of what Festos was up to was then revealed to the others in issue 6 because when he was the first Eternal to come back, he was alone with the machine and it was then when he discovered the cost of their immortality, which for the Eternals meant that every time that they were brought back after death, that this would come at the cost of the life of one human. So again, not only were the Eternals not protecting the humans, but they were also killing them at the same time. And as Hero Festos tells them how the Eternals no longer have a purpose, the world's protected by a grand array of heroes, which we'll find later that in some cases, these heroes are considered to be the new gods, versus the Eternals who are now like the old gods. But for Festos, he tried destroying the machine to end this, but destroying the machine also meant destroying the world, which leaves the Eternals just trapped in this loop. But it was at this time where Festos, he had pretty much told them everything about Thanos, as well as Festos nearly destroying the machine. And after this, they took the information to Zerus, the Prime Eternal, who had been resurrected at this point. But more importantly than them just finding that Festos was behind this, they were all more concerned about the resurrection killing humans part. And Zerus let them know that there's probably something they could do, but they have to discuss this within the Unimind so that all the Eternals can have a say. But come to find out, the Eternals as a whole, they didn't care because many of the humans would be dead in a number of decades anyway. And this left Icarus and the others desperate for change, which is what sent them to Lemuria to get answers from the Deviants, who are able to change unlike them. But after not getting answers directly from the Deviants, this then later led them to get answers from the Progenitor. And to do so, rather than just asking the Avengers, they broke into Avengers Mountain, which is something that only added to Iron Man and the Avengers not trusting the Eternals. And through the course of this, we discover that Druig is working with Thanos as an advisor, and it's really one of those things where Druig is like, Thanos, why didn't you come to me early? You know I stay scheming. <laughs> and on the flip side, Thanos is like, well, I've had a Mephisto in my ear before, and you're not quite Mephisto. But even still, in the background throughout this series, they end up working together, with Thanos knowing that he's being played either by Festos or Druid the whole time. And from there, they form their untrusting alliance, 
and at this point his suggestion to give Thanos what he wanted, it was simply for Druid to rig the election for Prime Eternal so that once Zerus was gone, again, Thanos would easily take his place. Because with Thanos as the new Eternal Prime, he would have more access and a better chance at getting what he wants. And so of course this led to Thanos killing Zerus again. But this time around with doing so, Thanos had become Eternal Prime with the help of Druig. But fast forward towards the conclusion, Druig had helped Thanos capture Festos, to where then Thanos tortured Festos in an attempt to force him into fully integrating Thanos with the machine. But as it turns out, Festos didn't really know how, and he had no plans of doing so after using Thanos to stop the Eternals from killing the humans, because at this point he had only given Thanos partial integration. So Festos suggested that Thanos just ask his parents, but when he asked them, they didn't cooperate. And for Thanos, this brings him to the point of failing after multiple attempts of trying to fully integrate integrate with the machine, to where then Thanos is just like, you know what, how about I just activate the Doomsday failsafe and just destroy the world, cause why not? But as for the other Eternals who have made their way to Lemuria, the home of the Deviants, who have now made their way to Avengers Mountain, a number of them run a distraction to keep the Avengers busy while Ajax communicates with the ghost of the dead Celestial in order to get the secrets of the Deviants. And with her doing this, the Celestial ghost, he wasn't trying to talk to her at all and mainly because the Celestials, they like the Avengers now and not the Eternals. So for Ajax to actually get this information on the Deviants, she had to beat it out of this guy. But with her taking this method, it's effective. She gets the full schematic scriptures for the Deviants, their design goals, everything. And she also discovers that the Deviants are the important ones. But with Ajax getting the information, Cersei then tells the Avengers that Thanos is on Earth and he's seconds away from destroying it, which from there allows these guys to go after Thanos and pretty much get beat up for a while. But when Thanos initiates the Doomsday failsafe, it's here where the contingency of Festos kicks in. Because when Festos brought Thanos back, he had more or less put a kill switch in Thanos in case Thanos betrayed him. But also Festos had made sure that in the event that something happened to where he couldn't activate himself or if he was killed and that memory was lost on how to activate it, Festos made sure that his felt safe would activate if Thanos ever triggered a world ending event. And with the way that this was done away from the others, it made it seem as if Druid could save the day. And so of course with Druid being Druid, he takes the credit. And it's from here where Druid then becomes the Prime Eternal. And from here, when Cersei fills in Tony and the others about the whole Thanos situation, which includes the fact that Thanos was the prime eternal at one point, which kind of made him ruler of the planet, and this just makes Tony and the Avengers trust the Eternals even less. And even at this point, Cersei hasn't told them everything. But after this, we then go to Olympia with Druid, who's enjoying his new position on the throne. But he also believes that with himself being the Prime Eternal, that he has to find a way to give his people purpose. And to do so, he has the machine search for Deviants. But now with the updated information that Ajax had got from Avengers Mountain, this search first brings up Lemuria, the home of the Deviants. But then next to it, another spot lights up. And this location is Krakoa. And with seeing this, Druid also discovers that not only is this the capital for mutants, but also that these mutants have recently expanded to the planet Mars, or better yet the planet formerly known as Mars, which is planet Arako now. But with Druid discovering this, it's here where he initially sees the expansion of mutants on Mars as excess deviation. But on top of this, we get a bit more information in the 2022 Free Comic Book Day Judgment Day issue, when we get a flashback just shy of a million years ago. And it's here where we find Druid with Odin, the leader of the Avengers 1 million BC, as well as Duranos. And it's at this time, shortly after the prehistoric Avengers had came together, when Druid had invited Odin out here to show him these monkeys that had developed telepathy and telekinesis that he had seen as excess deviation. But Druig had just called Odin out here to let Odin know that this whole species was going to be exterminated because of their excess deviation. And Odin just allowed this to happen. And with doing so, Odin said that it's not worth going to war over a few little monkeys. But now fast forward to current day with Druig now being the prime eternal and the latest version of excess deviation that he's now discovered is the mutants of Krakoa who initially caught his attention when the machine pulled them up, as well as the civilization on planet Arako. But one of the first moves that Druid makes is sending in Jack of Knives to investigate, to where then Jack of Knives discovers that the mutants have figured out immortality. And with Jack of Knives reporting back to Druid, he lets him know that the mutants and death aren't a thing anymore, they're eternal. And when Jack of Knives asks what is the plan as far as what's their next course of action, Druid lets Jack know that it depends on if this striking mutation is a deviation. And from there, Jack replies, well, if it is. And Druid is just like, Jack, let's be honest, nothing we haven't done before. 
So in other words, Druid just wants to do the mutants just like the monkeys. <laughs> so from here, I'm gonna refrain from going on a rant and we'll just pick back up with Judgment Day Part 1. And so now real quick, I wanna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below so we can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.